Um, good morning and welcome to the FCCJ. Thank you those um, who have come to the club and also those watching online. My name is Andy Sharp. Uh, I work at the Nikkei Asian Review. Um, today with a very special guest, um, it's Audrey Tang. She's Taiwan's digital minister, a 39-year-old former hacker with a reported very high IQ, who at the age of 14 co-founded a computer book publisher and developed a search engine. She went on to become a Silicon Valley consultant for the likes of Apple. Um, Audrey Tang was invited into President Tsai Ing-wen's cabinet in 2016 to help boost Taiwan's digital prowess. She's gone on to help lead the country's much applauded fight against the coronavirus by helping develop apps to spread the distribution of masks and economic stimulus coupons. Um, there's much to discuss. Um, clearly, um, China tech is a, a big issue here. In a recent interview with my colleagues at the Nikkei in Taipei, she said that allowing Chinese equipment into a country's core telecom infrastructure is like inviting a Trojan horse into the network. But anyway, without further ado, I believe Ms. Tang is going to make a short speech, and we have a bunch of questions already received online, and we'll also take questions from the room. So, um, I'm just to introduce myself, by the way, I'm the moderator. This is uh, Teddy Jimbo, he's the FCCJ PAC co chair. Okay. Hi, Andrew. Over to you. Hello. Um, so, my extremely short speech, about 30 seconds long, <laughs> is just to introduce the Slido system that we're going to use for this live Q&A. I see there's already seven questions being asked. Um, so, very quickly, I think uh, they will project the Slido link uh, on the screen. But if um, the tech is still being worked on, you can also manually uh, go to slido.com. That's S-L-I-D-O.com uh, and enter this code. The code is zero. 0727. So 00727. Uh, and so uh, whether it's by scanning the QR code, hopefully to be projected soon, uh, or by going to slido.com and enter 00727, you can like each other's questions. And the question with the most number of likes uh, will flow to the top. And I will answer that first. <laughs> uh, and, and if uh, we get all the questions, that's great. And at any given time, of course, you can ask new questions, which will appear on the uh, bottom um, right of the projection screen. Uh, and if I cannot get to all the questions by the end of the hour, sorry about that, uh, but if uh, people have anything to ask from the, um, from the podium, uh, actually I, I don't see the camera of the uh, person, on, people on site, so the moderator will have to interrupt me during my answer to the online questions so that we can get a good uh, online offline mix. That's my opening presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so I guess you want to start by Mm -hmm. answering some of the questions that's been sent so far on Slido. That's right. That's yeah. right. So the, the top one currently uh, from, um, sorry if uh, my pronunciation is not perfect, uh, from Ilgin uh, Yorumat uh, from uh, BBC World Turkish. <laughs> the question was, what well, would I advise other governments in how to deal with social media companies when it comes to balancing citizen privacy while maintaining free speech? Uh, we believe in Taiwan that free speech um, is a core value. It's not an instrumental value. Indeed, according to the Civicus Monitor, we're the only jurisdiction in Asia which allows the completely open freedom of speech assembly, the press, and so on. Um, and if you count New Zealand, that's uh, one of the only two in Asia Pacific. Um, and so, in our norm, uh, it's not about takedown. We don't believe in takedown. We believe that a journalist's word should always be worth the same as a minister's word, actually more. Um, and so, the point is not uh, allowing the administration to kind of collaborate with social media companies to take down anything, but to rather uh, work out a way for people who see this information as defined as intentional untruths to do public harm, the antithesis of journalism, um, people can flag it very easily. And so, uh, in for example, I'll use a metaphor. Maybe you've uh, noticed that uh, in your email inbox, if you receive an email saying that, I, I don't know, they're a royalty, uh, they have like 10,000 uh, bitcoins and they want to uh, wire you you if you just pay this small deposit and so on is a scam, by the way. Um, and so uh, you would probably flag it as fine. 
and that is the norm in the internet governance. Uh, basically, email is supposed to be private, but if you flag something as spam, you donate the signature, the fingerprint of that email, so that people who receive similar email in the future, they still receive the email, but it goes to the spam mail, the junk mail folder, rather than the inbox. That is to say, it doesn't pay to send spam after a sufficient number of flagged it because it stops wasting people's time. Uh, and so, similarly, when people flag things on the, for example, line, which is an to an encrypted channel um, as scam or, or spam, it gets sent to the international fact-checking network members in Taiwan. There's two, the MicroPen and in the Taiwan Fact-Checking Center. And they make sure that they flag things as scam or as disinformation as soon as possible. And the role of the government is just to make sure that we, uh, once we detect that there's a, such a trending disinformation, not only do we with journalists so that they can do a attribution, a public attribution so that people understand it is actually not true when they see it online or on the uh, Facebook media and so on, but we also roll out counter messages that are true um, up to what we understand uh, and then uh, package in a very funny way. And this is what we call humor over rumor because uh, a lot of conspiracy theory travel um, outrage and if we publish something that uh, is very funny, literally a person cannot simultaneously feel joy and outrage about the same thing. Um, and so because of that, people who have seen, for example, um, our premier uh, wiggling his butt saying uh, that uh, there's no need to panic by tissue papers because we only have one pair of butt each and by the way tissue papers are of the different material than uh, medical mask so ramping on medical mask doesn't uh, hurt uh, tissue paper production that's very funny and has a higher R value than the original conspiracy theory and so that is the idea of humor over rumor and partnering with journalists and fact checking organization and the social media companies basically conform to this norm by doing notice and public notice Okay, thank you. Maybe we can go on to the next question from uh, on, on your list from Pio. Okay, Pio from Italy. Yes. And um, the question is, do I think the world can survive without Chinese technology? Uh, and uh, I think um, Pio doesn't mean uh, paper, uh, but rather Huawei. Um, and so um, I think uh, in Taiwan, uh, as uh, actually the moderator have already mentioned, um, during the Sunflower Movement uh, in 2014, there's half a million people on the street, many more online, deliberating each and every aspect of the cross Strait Service and Trade Agreement, or CSSTA. Uh, and one of the aspects was this very issue. And it's not about any particular company, though. Uh, the issue was about whether we want to allow PRC components in our then new 4G infrastructure. And the consensus on the street later ratified by the National Communication Commission and the National Security Council is no. And the reason is not um, that the, they're inferior or that they necessarily um, come with malice or whatever, but rather um, with the realization that there is no private sector organization in the PRC. Uh, when the need comes, uh, the state can always make a de facto state owned by um, searching and replacing uh, leadership. And so basically uh, that says each time we upgrade, even though the previous version that we installed have passed cybersecurity scrutiny, we will have to do that over again because there's no telling whether uh, there are um, state-owned or de facto state-owned actors um, trying to, uh, via this upgrade, to install new backdoors into the system. And so the total cost of ownership of maintenance is deemed too high uh, compared to um, other um, vendors. Uh, and so because of that, uh, starting from 4G, uh, that's 2014, we did not use any PRC components in the core infrastructure. And what little there were, I think, were all replaced by 2016. Um, and so, uh, obviously, we survived uh, not only uh, the pandemic and infodemic, but we have pretty good 5G connection. I'm holding a 5G phone uh, using, um, this is LG technology, I think, uh, as we speak. Uh, and so, obviously, we're doing fine, not only surviving, but thriving. Okay, thank you. I'm going to um, open this to, to the room as well for any questions, so please raise your hands if you have anything. But let me just ask one question first. Mm -hmm. It's a question sent by email from Peter Elstrom at Bloomberg News. Mm -hmm. He asks, do you think there is a justification for governments around the world to tighten controls or ban social media apps such as TikTok and WeChat? And are there specific security risks that those apps pose to users? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Taiwan, uh, we make a distinction uh, between the social sanction, which is a very strong um, um, power. Uh, for example, Facebook, uh, during our election in 2018, uh, the mayoral election, uh, because our control branch, as a separate branch of the government, published uh, for the first time the raw data of campaign donation and expense. People independently discovered, by people I mean investigative journalists, independently discovered uh, that there's a large swath of campaign donation expense that's not filed to the control branch, and these are social media advertisements, precision uh, targeted advertisements. Uh, and uh, of course, Facebook, um, at that time, that there was no uh, disclosure of the kind of the control branch, the radical transparency that we did. Uh, and so there's a um, social backlash. People were saying that the, um, Facebook, by not disclosing it to the control and standards, is hurting the democracy by allowing extrajudicial um, donations huh, uh, to the campaign sponsorships to the campaigns uh, and uh, that has a detrimental effect on the democracy uh, and because of that the contrarian norms which uh, is two right first only uh, domestic citizens uh, get to donate uh, and second each and every raw expensive ex uh, the, um, item is published uh, we basically had a public conversation around it the transcript of which is online uh, with all the social media companies um, and uh, we agreed on a norm uh, on a counter disinformation self-regulation principle uh, and the implicit outside game is always of course that if Facebook doesn't publish its advertisements library, its ads library uh, to the same degree or more uh, as com compared to the control yuan even though that we may not have the legal instruments to, to shut down Facebook or to dispel Facebook uh, people would feel that Facebook is actively uh, working Working against our democracy, and so we'll boycott uh, Facebook, and that's what I call social sanction. And so, by the presidential election um, this year, they basically implemented the same control norms and publishing the ads uh, library in real time for people to fact check, working with investigative journalists. And so, that is the kind of norm conversations that we've had. And of course, Google and Twitter simply refrain from running advertisements. So, I think um, for questions like this, instead of saying like we should outright ban it. Uh, or that we should allow it, um, getting a social norm, a social outrage, if you will, uh, about the kind of threat that it could have on democracy um, and negotiating a safe um, norm. And so making sure that um, international companies uh, conform to that norm in an auditable, uh, accountable fashion, uh, that is preferred. And only if they refuse to negotiate, only if they refuse to conform to the norm, do we go to the social sanction route and eventually the state action route. Okay, thank you. Um, questions from the room? Yes, Nakano san. My name is Nakano, I'm freelance. Thank you, uh, Minister Tang. I have uh, two questions. Uh, just let me hear uh, what's going on in Taiwan these days. Is there any digital gap between generations in Taiwan? And my second question is, do elderly people have difficulty accepting the digitization of the society in Taiwan? Sorry, sorry, I didn't get the second question. Do oh, okay, okay. Uh, do, old, do old people, do elderly people have difficulty accepting the digitization uh, of society in Taiwan? Ah, okay, thank you. Yeah, um, there's just a, uh, I think, uh, NPR and New York Times piece uh, about how a Taiwanese couple in their 80s uh, becomes Instagram's newest fashion influencers. Uh, they own a laundry shop in central Taiwan and became Instagram stars uh, by kind of posing as models, um, the uh, laundries that, that their customers uh, never picked up. Um, and so they, they run a very successful Instagram campaign. Uh, and so the, the, the point I'm trying to make uh, is that this is a lifelong learning process. This is not necessarily uh, that the older people are not digitally competent it's just that if we uh, shape the conversations so that we encourage everybody to learn uh, and the technologies in Taiwan basically says that we need to adapt to the societal needs. It's not asking a certain population to come to technology. Rather, it is uh, us, the technologists, conforming uh, to what the societal expectation, the societal norms of technologies are. And so 
I just uh, mentioned 5G. When we're deploying 5G, um, there's a auction on the spectrum. There's a lot of extra money uh, that we can allocate, and we allocate it uh, to the places where the 4G connections are least utilized, specifically around in more rural areas, in the places with a higher average um, age of population, uh, and to focus on education, that's lifelong learning, and health. Uh, and these are the two things that uh, people across all age groups uh, feel um, passionate about. And so, yes, of course, there is some digital gap, uh, but it is uh, actually not as severe as most uh, other places uh, because we have broadband as a human right, we have digital opportunity centers, and most importantly, we emphasize lifelong learning uh, around especially education and health um, um, areas. And so that's the, the main idea. Uh, and the other thing I want to bring bring upon is that, uh, like my, my own grandma, uh, 87 years old, uh, I consult her all the time when we're designing new digital uh, services, like the mask rationing. You can um, pre-order masks using your national health insurance card on any local kiosk by any local convenience store, of which there's more than 20,000 uh, in Taiwan. And so um, they um, work, uh, my grandma suggested uh, that I consult her younger friend, who is 77 years old. Uh, and uh, Grandma Yang, her friend, um, told me a lot of things. For example, that we should pay over the counter rather than to the ATM, because a lot of the elderly people associate ATM with uh, scam. Uh, and so that we really need to allow cash-based payment when you're uh, pre-ordering the mask on the convenience stores and many other small things like that. And so I think the wisdom of the elders are also very important where we're designing digital services. Okay, thank you. Um, take another question here um, online. It's um, from Anthony Rowley at the uh, SCMP. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, you said you know, in, the, in the Nikkei interview that allowing Chinese equipment into a, company, a country's infrastructure is like inviting a Trojan horse in. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you think this and how exactly does this work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I was uh, simply relaying the rough consensus of the 2014 occupiers. So it's not my view, it's uh, what the occupiers uh, feel at the time and then ratified by the National Security Council and National Communication Commission. And how does that work? Well, um, if you uh, install certain components, uh, no matter whether it's software or hardware, of course you do a security audit. Uh, but then uh, necessarily, either in an emergency situation, for example, when it's out of service, uh, or wh whether there's just a security vulnerability that's uh, discovered and disclosed, you will probably have to update that piece of uh, software and firmware and even hardware from the vendor. Uh, and uh, the main uh, idea around the Occupy in 2014 was that we never know at which point would the CCP, through its party branches um, installed in all the large so-called privately owned enterprises, um, did do a swap of the leadership uh, and take de facto control of the private um, enterprise so that it become de facto state owned. So every time you upgrade, you have to do another systemic risk assessment, which could be done, uh, but the feeling at the time is that the risk is too high and the total cost of ownership too high. Uh, we would be better to work with other vendors from liberal democratic countries. Okay, thank you. Now I'm just gonna put up this um Take a picture of this for the audience, please. It's for questions to Ms. Tang on, uh, on um, Slido. HTTPS hyphen slash slash SLI dot DO slash zero zero seven two seven. And, and I'm using it here now and it, it's, it's very clear and easy to use. So people at home, if you want to send a question, um, please use this, um, this link. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, another question that's come in by um, on on, on um, Slido is from Patrick Welter at FAZ at uh, German Media. Um, with the economic quarrel between the U.S. and the People's Republic of China, do you expect that companies will leave China and move to Taiwan or elsewhere? 
Okay. Um, well, the first time I've seen PRC spelled PR space China. Interesting spelling. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> right. Um, so um, yeah, uh, I think there's there's two things. Uh, the first is that we are already seeing um, companies that thrive only on uh, free speech. For example, media companies, uh, the journalism uh, workers, uh, they are already uh, setting up their headquarters uh, in Taiwan uh, and either moving from Hong Kong or moving from PRC um, to Taiwan and uh, people who hold, for example, the Oslo Freedom Forum um, choose Taiwan as their base. Uh, indeed, the reporter without borders, reporter Sans Frontier, um, choose Taiwan uh, as their uh, regional headquarter. And all of this, of course, is recognizing the fact uh, that in Taiwan, a journalist word is worth um, at least uh, the same or if not more uh, compared to a minister's words and you will not get, quote, harmonized, unquote, or, quote, disappear, unquote, um, if you say something that uh, hurts the image of a minister that's just good journalism. Uh, and so I, I think anything that thrives on free speech, anything that thrives on uh, what we call a permissionless innovation, um, including many um, more uh, I interesting uh, fintech, including DeFi, uh, distributed finance uh, companies, and so on, they necessarily uh, think that Taiwan is a better place, uh, even though that uh, their um, innovations may not um, be restrained to Taiwan only. Taiwan offers a really good sandbox for people to experiment there. And that includes also what we call digital nomad, uh, who can hold a Taiwan gold card. Uh, you can check it out at taiwangoldcard.com. Uh, and there's, uh, I think, by this time, almost a thousand now of people holding these three-year uh, resident and work permits, um, and they don't have to find an employer. They can work for themselves, for an international company, and so on, but just enjoy Taiwan as a safe and free space. Um, and so many people visit just by visitors' visa, a tourism visa, and so on, and they decide they like it, and they're a um, foreign talent, and they uh, just apply for the gold card and just convert uh, their six months uh, trip into a three-year stay, and we're seeing a lot of that uh, going from the direction of PRC as well. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from the um, from Slido here. It's from Kantaro Suzuki, a freelance reporter. Um, he's asking, were there any cyber attacks from China during the recent Taiwanese presidential election? And if so, can you tell us how you blocked these attacks? Well, there's cyber attacks um, literally every hour. Um, and so the, the question is, yes, no matter which day you ask. <laughs> and um, fortunately, most of those uh, attacks were uh, thwarted uh, automatically by the defense in depth uh, system that we deployed. Uh, and so it did not really interfere the uh, presidential election. Although uh, there's a lot of disinformation campaigns, which are not strictly speaking cyber attacks uh, in the traditional of cybersecurity sense, uh, but there were a spe um, specifically around the anti-ELAP protest uh, in Hong Kong. We have seen concerted disinformation campaigns in the Taiwanese social media. For example, there was one last November uh, that tries to, to portray the young people who go to the street in Hong Kong as, uh, quote, um, uh, thugs that gets paid $200,000 to murder police, unquote. Uh, and, and they even use a Reuters photo. Uh, but the Reuters photo said, uh, the caption initially said nothing of that sort. So they just swapped a different caption saying that uh, this 13 years old uh, bought new iPhones because they went on the street getting paid like mercenaries and things like that. Of course, it's completely untrue. And, and it's really making the round on the Tony social media. And again, we did a um, attribution, uh, a public attribution notice and public notice thanks to the help uh, by the International uh, Fact Checking Network in particular Taiwan Fact Check Center, uh, and who traced uh, the original post to the Weibo of the Zhongyang Zhengfa Wei, of the Central Political and Law Unit of the CCP. Um, and that's very interesting because uh, it's not covert. It's not like traditional cybersecurity attack. It's right there on their Weibo. Um, maybe they did not pay for the uh, license uh, from the Reuters photographer, um, and simply just uh, use a new caption to, to sow discord and spread 
this information. So there's a lot of that, and you can check Taiwan Fact Check Center and Michael Penn and so on for a list of things. There's one about the invisible ink provided by the CIA, and quote, if you vote for Han, your ink will disappear uh, and replaced by the invisible ink that appears uh, for Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, unquote. Um, and of course, the way to debunk those is very simply encourage YouTubers to uh, record and live stream even the counting process because we are using paper ballots. We use the counting process inviting journalists um, to film from all the different sites. And, and so if there is invisible ink, I'm sure that it will get discovered and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of overt work uh, on this information. Uh, but uh, I think it's um, proved to be uh, much less impactful in the presidential election compared to the mayoral election, partly because the social media agreed on the counter disinformation norms. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question is from uh, Martin Kolling. He's a correspondent for Handelsblatt, a German financial paper. Um, he's saying that in Germany and Japan, the voluntary apps for tracking have been a failure so far. Um, and the approaches by Taiwan and South Korea have been rejected because of privacy concerns. What is your answer to that? This is saying anything that, that's in place when I'm born is human nature. And anything that's introduced after I'm born is called technology. Uh, and so paraphrase, so in Taiwan, democracy is a technology. And, and uh, paraphrasing that, uh, we could say that any measures that's already uh, taken by the state before the pandemic is considered norm. And any measure that's introduced only after the pandemic would be considered novel. Um, and so in Taiwan, for for example, the digital fence uh, relied on a system that's already in place and that's advanced earthquake and flood warnings so that people in certain regions uh, will receive an automated um, cell broadcast or a SMS uh, like seconds before a major earthquake happening or that if they're in a vulnerable place, uh, a flood when there's typhoon or a heavy rain. Uh, indeed, last night I just received one uh, because of an earthquake, uh, giving me plenty of time. By plenty, I mean maybe a few seconds uh, to to find some place uh, solid. Um, and so uh, because that's already in place, this geofenced SMS delivery is already in place. So when we repurpose that so that people who return to Taiwan can choose either to go to a quarantine hotel for 14 days or if you decide to stay home, if they have a bathroom of their own and they don't live with people in the vulnerable groups, they can choose to place their phone instead under quarantine. That is the digital fence. And whenever the phone escapes the roughly 50 meter radius. It's not GPS, it's just cell phone tower broadcasting uh, triangulation. Uh, just like receiving an SMS of earthquake warning, uh, their phone and the nearby household managers as well police will receive such an SMS and they will check their whereabouts. And so because of that, uh, the system is already quite well understood uh, before the pandemic. When we repurpose that, people feel that it is a narrow, deep intrusion to the privacy but it's clearly time limited and it goes away after 14 days and we do not collect new data. Um, and so that is felt um, as okay. Uh, so I think every jurisdiction need to look at the toolkits that's already in place before the pandemic and see if you can uh, use a different configuration uh, in an appropriate technology manner so that people understand already how it works. Uh, the Greenfield code, that is to say code that's produced after the pandemic, of course, will always face a stronger scrutiny because there was no previous audits. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, and it's also partly something I want to ask myself, is where do you see like the East Asian countries such as Taiwan, Japan, China, South Korea on the digi digitization ladder? I mean, how do these countries compare to each other? And how do they compare to places such as the EU and the EU US? Because um, there's a lot, of, a lot of concern here in Japan about, you know, how Japan has been in some ways slow to digitize, um, especially, and this has come up with the um, COVID-19 um, pandemic. Yeah, in, in Taiwan, uh, we see the digitalization project not as one letter, but as four letters. Uh, and it's very easy to remember. Um, the four letters are called digitization, innovation, governance, 
and inclusion. Uh, and they, the acronym is, of course, DG, easy to remember. Uh, and so, uh, and they talk about different aspects. Uh, digitization talks about broadband as human right, talks about uh, the 5G infrastructure, talks about uh, the uh, fact that most uh, services provided by the government has a digital equivalent. The innovation um, costs uh, about presidential hackathon, about sandboxes, about the kind of uh, freedom to innovate uh, even in a more or less disruptive way. Uh, and that's the innovation part. And the governance part talks about regulatory technology, the RECTAC, um, <clears throat> the government's own way of getting a rough consensus from the people, from the stakeholders that's affected by the innovations so that we can come up with new norms uh, that can then uh, guide the technology so that it works with people or even after the people rather than just for people. Uh, and finally, the inclusion part talks about the Digital Opportunity Center, talks about the intergenerational solidarity, talks about how we're working to right the wrongs of the um, social injustice and so on uh, using technologies that <coughs> empower people closest to the suffering rather than in a way that excludes them from conversation. So that includes, for example, participation by people who are not of the voting age or even uh, ways like the civil IoT infrastructure that uh, makes uh, AI or water or mountains, oceans previously unrepresented uh, in the democratic conversation to represent them uh, in the democratic conversation. And so these are four very different pillars and it's hard to make a um, kind of linear projection, linear conversation because it's all about the societal priorities. And I don't think there's right or wrong about these. And in Taiwan, we try to make sure that all those four pillars uh, support each other rather than uh, detract from each other and cause polarized heated debates uh, between the different pillars. That is to say, the way to connect those pillars is what I'm focusing on, not making one pillar particularly high to the detriment of the other cultures. This is called transculturalism. Just to follow up quickly there, and then I'll come to you in one second, please. Um, would you have any advice for lawmakers and policymakers in Japan on how to improve the dig digitization process here? Well, I think um, in Taiwan, we're uh, conscious of not making this about uh, kind of paperless uh, or CO-less uh, or things like that. It's not about uh, removing the previous ways of doing things. Uh, there's always more than one way to do it. So just the triple stimulus voucher have no less than four different variants depending on the payment method uh, and more than three uh, methods of uh, collecting even just the paper uh, part. Uh, and so the point here that I'm making is that uh, if you work with the stakeholders across different generations, you will uh, find ways that uh, doesn't take away from anyone. Like in the National Palace Museum, Wu Gong in Taiwan, we work on to improve the ticketing process to reduce queuing. Previously, they found that uh, the elderly people insist on queuing uh, with paper ticket rather than using QR code uh, for uh, the ticketing process like the high-speed rails. It's not that elderly people doesn't like QR codes. It's, it's that after interviews, we discovered they really like this paper ticket because they can take it home uh, to put it in their diaries, to share with their families on dinner tables. Uh, the, the token, this paper token, really matters. And after we did this interview, we discovered they'll be perfectly happy if after using QR code to very quickly get into the museum, they can collect the receipt. And nobody says the receipt has to be uh, dull and uninteresting. It could be um, gold-plated, right? It could have their name on it. It could have any number of beautiful design, including QR code that you can scan and uh, bring to your grandchildren's island on a popular uh, Nintendo Switch game, uh, and things like that, which, uh, by the way, the National Pest Museum actually do. Uh, and so this kind of uh, intergenerational uh, co-creation workshop is the key in producing digitalization project that doesn't make any Anyone feel that they have been left behind, and that is a key here. Okay, thank you. Question over here, please. Hello, uh, my name is Kondo from uh, Gendai Business Japan. Uh, my question is uh, that uh, the Chinese government seems that the internet is a tool for controlling 1.4 billion Chinese people. And uh, what do you think of this policy? And it will succeed? Thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, um, we have seen that previous attempts at uh, totalitarian uh, government is at most sub-totalitarian because there was no uh, sufficient technologies uh, to ensure a total tracking of people. Uh, now in places like uh, Xinjiang, of course, we are seeing that uh, the prototypes of a truly total, not just sub-total, um, totalitarian surveillance uh, regime uh, is being uh, worked on. Um, and so my main point here is that in Taiwan, because we are a liberal democracy, we see things through a human right and democracy lens. And so these attempts, uh, for example, in Xinjiang that I just alluded to, um, is basically prompting uh, all the sectors in Taiwan, not just we, the uh, social sector people, the hacktivists, but also people in the private sector and so on, to look at these applications and technologies and serves as a really um, strong reminder that we should not go there. And this is also why we have such a strong societal norm, for example, against takedowns uh, and lockdowns, by the way. Um, and that is because uh, we just look at the takedowns, uh, the surveillance uh, censorship regime, uh, the great firewall sometimes turn into a great cannon um, and say that we should totally not go there. So in a interesting sense, it actually made consensus easier to reach uh, in the Taiwan political discussion when it's about emerging technology, because people can just bring out a argument saying what you're doing, censorship of the internet, are we going to the root of the PRC? And that proposal became a non sata Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of um, geopolitical questions have come in online here too. Um, let's, uh, so I'll probably ask you them both together now. Um, unfortunately, we don't have this person's name for this one, but this person asks um, about hearing about Huawei spying for the Chinese Communist Party, um, especially Mr. Clump, Mr. Trump sorry, <laughs> making these claims. Um, but we've not seen any proof presented. What would you say about this first, my first question mm -hmm. there? And as I said in the very beginning, I'm not uh, making any comments about any specific companies. Indeed, when we talk about the 4G and uh, uh, Sunflower rough consensus, the conversation on the street is not about specifically Huawei or ZTE or any companies. It's about a systemic risk assessment of the de facto control of the state from the PRC government to their so-called private sector companies. And so that is uh, our main argument and my main message. Uh, to uh, people around the world. Uh, I do not, uh, as a rule, comment on specific companies. Okay, thank you. And following up there with a question from um, someone called Tom. Very simple question. When do you think China will invade Taiwan? Well, I think that is a question to uh, PRC leadership. That is certainly not a uh, question uh, from, from us. Uh, and so I have no idea. Uh, I cannot offer an answer of that question. Okay. <laughs> Understandable as well. Okay. Uh, Josh, got a question from the room now. Hello, Ms. Tong. I'm working for Swiss Radio and Television. Can you talk a little bit about your own career and about your priorities today as Minister of Digitization to, to promote the development of the software industry in Taiwan and to make it as competitive or even more competitive as in China or in the U.S.? Thank you. Um, my, my own upbringing uh, is, uh, as the moderator have introduced, an entrepreneur uh, and later on work as an open source movement consultant uh, to large companies including Apple uh, so that they can work more in the open. Uh, and the idea here is very simply that open innovation works better than uh, closed room uh, innovation when it comes to software because the, one of the key of software is that uh, while making new software is very easy, maintaining software in the face of changing society is very costly. And if we can empower all the citizens of software uh, to become co-creators rather than just users um, who often connote a very, I don't know, addictive um, way of relationship to technology, there are some other industries that also use the term users, um, we uh, need to rethink the relationship of software making and people who use the software. Uh, and so because 
because of that, uh, my uh, job description, I think, very clearly uh, explains the priorities uh, that I have in mind. And so I'll just simply read my job description, which is very short. Uh, and it goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And when we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've got a question here following up on the Internet of Things. It's again from Anthony Rowley at the SCMP. Has 5G made it easier to access the Internet of Things from outside, granting others access to vital control systems? Not necessarily, um, because the information flow can be configured in various different ways. For example, in Taiwan, there's a lot of people voluntarily putting uh, air boxes that is uh, very cheap, less than 100 US dollars, uh, PM 2.5 and other air quality detectors on the balconies, on the primary schools uh, to teach kids um, the digital competence uh, so that they become data producers, data stewards, rather than just consumers of data. Uh, and so that is, of course, a great educational tool, but it also enabled us to have a very complete structure uh, of uh, moving this to other, uh, for example, water pollution sensing and uh, mask uh, availability level and so on. Uh, it enables uh, the entire community, the entire society to collaboratively do sense making about things. But uh, it relies on the ideas of a distributed ledger that everybody can just write to, append to uh, without taking control of anybody else's numbers. That is to say it is just a way for data uh, to grow into a ledger structure without uh, relinquishing uh, any source code, algorithm and control or things like that. It's a commons uh, in a data collaborative for all to use. And if you configure it this way, then there is no risk of uh, people interfering with the control systems of the larger, for example, uh, environmental sensors or the industrial processes and so on, because people just write to this distributed ledger and the use of that ledger uh, is governed by its own logic uh, according to each and every collaborator in the data collaborative. And so there are ways to design the data flow such that this concerns is minimized. But it's very important to look at into the 5G um, specification and see where do we want to place the computing. Is it at the edge? Is it at the data centers? Is there something in between? Is it federated learning? Is it about uh, protection of private data using um, differential privacy or or fully homomorphic encryption uh, or open algorithms or things like that. And in Taiwan, we're looking to establish, uh, just uh, as uh, Japan recently did, a dedicated data protection authority that is independent from any ministries uh, that can look at those um, mathematical cryptographic building materials and suggest the best way to configure those. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here from um Nishimoto from the Asahi Shimbun, a Japanese newspaper. Um, you communicating, you know, obviously now through the world online. How would, how do, to you does, you know, online communication compare with face-to-face -face communication? What is the advantage of online, and what is the advantage of face-to-face? -face? Well, the advantage of online is um, twofold, right? First, that uh, we can see each other more clearly without wearing a medical mask. Uh, and uh, nowadays. Uh, and, the, and the second thing is that it reduces carbon footprint, also very important. Uh, and speaking personally, because I adjust jet lag very slowly, uh, it also is much better than long distance flight. Uh, because uh, on average, it takes me one day or more to adjust for one hour of uh, jet lag difference. But that's just a uh, you know, selfish reason. The other two are our, uh, public benefit. Um, in any case, the, the point I'm making is that uh, mostly uh, we can uh, replace uh, the knowledge sharing part of face-to-face -face gatherings using online conference as we're having now, uh, or even in virtual reality where we can share knowledge about three-dimensional spatial uh, objects uh, and uh, buildings and simulations and things like that. I even had a conversation uh, with uh, people in the primary and secondary schools uh, by shrinking my own avatar in virtual reality to the same height as the kids. And that really um, made them uh, much more uh, <laughs> eager to, to interact
back with me because I don't look a meter and uh, 80 centimeters high anymore. Uh, and so these are the great thing about online is that you can transcend the physical and acoustic uh, rules. Uh, but of course, there's uh, parts of face-to-face -face that are not replaceable. For example, the face-to-face -face conversations uh, that is around understanding what people feels like uh, is very important. And in face-to-face -face conversations, we often make, uh, for example, um, food and drinks and music and things like that, and making sure that uh, we can feel that we are not only in the same place talking about the same things, but feeling the same. And that is uh, harder to replicate in an online way, although I guess we can uh, order the same pizza delivery uh, uh, beforehand and have the same uh, beer or something. Uh, it could, of course, be arranged and approximated, but it's not as natural as people gathering uh, in the same face-to-face -face place. So in Taiwan, because we never had a lockdown, uh, what we have seen is that people uh, avoid large gatherings uh, when uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so uh, we see educational facilities encourage some kind of uh, satellite structure where people gather in preferably an outdoor place, keeping one meter distance so we don't have to wear a mask, uh, having food, enjoying drink together, and using large projectors or virtual reality to connect to many more such places so you can have the best of both worlds. Indeed, I'm working in a park in the Social Innovation Lab. So if you look out of the door, you can see uh, people just holding such outdoor gatherings at any given time. They can just uh, go through this um, place uh, and uh, look into uh, there's a visitor. Hi, uh, look into uh, my, my office and see very transparently how I'm working, why I'm working. But at the same time, we can amplify these face-to-face -face conversations to various different municipalities, different places using 5G technology, even to the most rural and highest mountains, so that people can also feel that they are in this co-creation workshop, no matter how remote they are. So I think uh, it's uh, eminently possible to make it the be both, uh, best of both worlds happen if you design the interaction space appropriately. OK, thank you. Um, another question here from Ilgin at uh, BBC World Turkish. She says, you're a civic hacker turned government minister. Where does your heart lie? And do you miss your earlier life as a conservative anarchist? Okay, my heart does not lie. Uh, well, um, I, I'm, uh, I'm a slushy, so I am uh, at once digital minister. That's my day job. Uh, but I'm also uh, moonlighting uh, as a civic hacker, um, not only for mask availability, uh, ma, but also, uh, for example, with Vitalik uh, Buterin, uh, creator of the Ethereum blockchain, uh, and um, Glenn Weil, uh, Daniel Allen, and so on. And we have a startup, uh, really an MPO, a social innovation organization called Radical Exchange uh, in New York. And I'm a board member. I'm also a board member of Digital Future Society in Barcelona, of Council of Democracy Foundation uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, and that's the original Madrid um, um, decision-making um, community after the 15M. Uh, and so very much civic hacker organizations. Uh, and uh, as long as I don't take a salary from those organizations, as long as they're not for profit, and as long as the premier, the prime minister, feels that it furthers our digital diplomacy, um, um, they, they are OK uh, with me moonlighting uh, as a civic hacker while being a digital minister. So I see myself as a channel, as a bridge, uh, as a Lagrange point uh, between civic movements on one side and governments on the other. And as the Lagrange point between the Earth and the Moon, there are three such points and two more behind the Earth and behind the Moon. Uh, I'm in a place to where I can more effortlessly um, balance between the movements and the governments and find a common purpose, common value, despite their initial very different positions. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question here about the your mask app. Um, it's from mm -hmm. uh, Riho Izawa at um, NTV uh, Japan. What was the most difficult thing um, regarding you know the use using you know creating and using the application such as the mask app? Um, or the mask map, sorry, when you were trying to deal with COVID-19 initially in Taiwan. What was the biggest challenge in creating such apps, given that obviously COVID-19 came, came very quickly? 
Well, as I said, uh, because uh, the uh, civic um, hackers already had experiences working with the air pollution map, working with the water boxes and so on, the code is already there. Uh, we just need to repurpose it with a new real-time uh, news feed, uh, a API, a application programming interface for the mass availability, which the National Health Insurance Agency provided very quickly uh, and is updated at a time every 30 seconds. So that's not the hard part. Uh, the most challenging part actually is in the negative externalities that it caused the pharmacists because as soon as we rolled out the mask availability mask uh, map we see that the pharmacies uh, who uh, swipe the NHI card and then hand out the mask uh, praising that it's working very well but there are also pharmacists that choose a different strategy they say that uh, you can get a numbered uh, badge uh, a numbered card uh, from the pharmacy in exchange of your NHI card and they just hand out those uh, number plates very quickly uh, and then uh, start to swipe the NHI card in bulk. And so it will create a couple of hours in which that they're just slowly um, doing this NHI card swiping uh, and telling the people who uh, have those numbers to collect in the afternoon, for example, so that the map will show that they still have mask in store, but actually they have already uh, rationed out all the mask of the day uh, using number plates. And so those pharmacists are actually quite upset of the map because map is inaccurate uh, and actually increase their work because people would just call them saying that why are there discrepancies are you keeping the map for yourselves yeah. and 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 even though they're volunteer they were not getting paid uh, and so this conflict is solved uh, quite quickly because that we have a weekly iteration cycle so when the pharmacy says okay we will announce the availability hours the schedules and you need to make a additional field in the open API for that we just adjust it very quickly. And eventually, we also develop a, a back-end button so that each pharmacist can just click that button and disappear from the map, which they will do if they uh, handed out all the number of plates and so on. And so this is truly a co-creation process, and there's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. Okay, good. Do you have any more questions from the room? Okay, I'll go to the next online question. Um, it's from Rick Weisberg from ELSS. How can democracies effectively deal with threats that unfold over long periods, despite relatively short cycles of elections and, of course, uh, corporate strategy? Well, I would argue the cycles of elections uh, are too long uh, for uh, real-time feedback. Uh, in Taiwan, during the pandemic, we have the Central Epidemic Command Center doing daily live uh, broadcasted press conferences such as this one where the journalists uh, ask anything they want and the minister always respond to each and every single one of them uh, and if you do this daily iteration cycle plus a toll-free number 1922 where everybody can call and not only get their question answered but also correct the parts that we did wrong for example there's um, a young boy uh, whose family called saying that my boy doesn't want to go to school because you only ration pink medical mask uh, to our our district and uh, we don't have other color of mask and our boy said that he will be bullied uh, and so the very next day uh, in the daily press conference all the medical officers start wearing pink uh, and the minister of health and welfare said pink panther was his childhood hero uh, in a way of gender mainstreaming I'm sure and suddenly the boy um, is the most hip person because only he has the color that the heroes are wearing uh, and so the point of this daily rather than every four years iteration is that the social sector can bond together and instead of just criticizing they can offer constructive uh, ways alternative visions forking the government uh, and uh, merge uh, on a daily cycle just as in open source development and so if you have a short enough iteration then the threats that unfold over long periods uh, will get uh, the collective intelligence sensing it long before it actually become a large problem for example when dr Li Wenliang, uh, the whistleblower from Wuhan, posted that there are, quote, seven new SARS cases, unquote, uh, in a local seafood market. Within 24 hours, it gets reposted uh, to PTT, the local equivalent of Reddit here, and it gets upvoted, so our medical officers take that into action. Imagine what would happen uh, if it would take us, you know, a year or so uh, to, to notice that post. That would be, have been impossible. So the, the way Dr. Li Wenliang became in 
literally a savior of Taiwanese population is having a collective intelligence mechanism and have a really short iteration cycle from noticing it into sense making, into triaging, into starting health ins inspections for all flights coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan the very next day, the first day of January of this year. So short iterations, quick merging of uh, alternative visions from the civil society, a strong and robust uh, social sector. I think these are the ways that democracies can effectively deal with threats uh, that are advanced and persistent. Okay, thank you. We have another question here from um, Izawa-san at NTV. Um, what is your message to Japan, given that it seems now to be in the midst of a second wave of the COVID-19 virus with increasing numbers of infections every day? Well, um, don't panic. Uh, that's <laughs> always the most important. Uh, <laughs> Right. Uh, and in, in Taiwan, we, we have a um, re really a very calm uh, minister, uh, Minister Chen Shizhong, that appears every day. So even though there were panic, like panic buying uh, of tissue papers, which was solved with a meme, uh, panic buying of instant noodles, which was solved with another brilliant meme uh, that says there is endless instant noodles, buy as much as you want, uh, and add some vegetables to it, so you have a balanced diet. Um, so the, the, whole point of making sure that people can remix those messages into a way that's calm, collected, and even humorous uh, is very important to make sure that people don't panic. And once they don't panic, uh, they have some mental capacity to understand some epidemiology and working with people who are closest to the suffering. I will use one example. In Taiwan, there was a day uh, when there was a confirmed case, uh, and the confirmed case said that they stay, she stayed at home uh, with no contact uh, to people, a very simple uh, family and so on. There's no way that she would get infected by the COVID. But uh, uh, medical officers keep on interviewing and the next day we discover works um, in a kind of um, uh, intimate bar uh, and as a professional um, uh, service provider in that intimate bar and she initially uh, provided a different account because she didn't uh, want to review uh, the people that she had uh, intimate encounters with uh, in that uh, intimate bar as a professional. Uh, and so um, at that point many people were saying that we should just shut down uh, any like nightclubs, intimate bars and so on. But Mr. Chen Shizong insists on saying, no, we're not pre putting them uh, any criminal um, threats. Uh, they're not criminals, they're professionals. And uh, we're not threatening them even uh, with the closure uh, fines. We're challenging them to discover ways that they can continue their business while observing physical distancing uh, and uh, real contact. That is to say, people have to file the way to contact them if there is really a uh, virus outbreak. And at the time, it was met with some um, ridicule because uh, people thought the entire point of intimate bars is to break the physical uh, and there really is no way that people would consent of leaving their uh, real contact um, details uh, to the intimate bars. But this is like the pick Malone effect, right? Um, uh, if you expect the civil society to come up with innovations, eventually they do. So there are some intimate bars that then discover that if you wear a, a, a cap uh, with a plastic shielding, then you can still uh, have a clear view uh, of the people who drink with you and even have drinks while observing the physical distancing rules. And if you keep uh, only on paper uh, your contact phone number, but under a pseudonym, and if you physically shred that paper after four week weeks of no uh, local outbreak, uh, then people actually trust them enough to actually leave their contact details and you can do an SMS uh, or line uh, to check that it's actually their number before they enter. So so they eventually rose up to the challenge and become part of our um, uh, conversation about the counter coronavirus pandemic. And so instead of casting any group as outsiders, I think it's important to work with each and every group, even though they're currently not capable of coming up uh, with uh, physical distancing rules and so on. Uh, the belief is that they eventually would. And once they do, the municipalities eventually um, uh, uh, require them to um, say which rules they're implementing and then based on that uh, accountability, then they are allowed to reopen. And that's just a uh, one of the very, uh, a lot of uh, bigness uh, into the Taiwanese counter coronavirus. But I hope this conveys the idea of co-creation. 
Okay, I think that brings us to the end of the hour. So thank okay. you very much for your time. Audrey, mm -hmm. much appreciated. We're going to send you by email a one-year honorary membership to the FCCJ. Oh, wow. So when, okay. you, when you are allowed to come to Japan, whenever that may be, we do hope you come and have a drink with us in the bar and tell some more of your stories. Okay, arigatou gozaimashita, and live long and prosper. <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.